It's a real pleasure to introduce this event to all of you from all over the world, West Coast to America, East Coast to Australia, and everything in between. I just want to introduce Michele a little bit to people who perhaps don't know him so well. Um, he's been working on many different subjects related to Ibn Arabi and to Sufism generally. Uh, he worked on a, a big project on local Sufi manuscripts in the Horn of Africa and the textual heritage there. He's also been working on the astrological views of Ibn Arabi, and we're hoping that uh, he will uh, produce uh, an interesting article on the planet Saturn, which is we are hoping for in the in the next year. He's covering his face now. <laughs> uh, he's also, as many of you know, been uh, organizing the summer schools, the studies in Sufism with Paolo Rizzi. And at the moment, he's working on a big project called Philosophy in Al-Andalus uh, on reconstructing the way in which philosophical and mystical ideas originated in the Iberian Peninsula. So without more ado, Michele, the floor is yours. We look forward to your talk very much. Well, thank you, Stephen, for this introduction. I will uh, share the screen. Thanks also to the Society for inviting me. And when Stephen told me about the topic and the uh, idea behind this series of meetings of the Ibn Arabi Society, my, mm, the name of Keith Critchlow um, instantly came to my mind as uh, during my years as a, um, as a university student, I remember a number of events that appeared as turning points in my learning path. At the very moment, they were happening. I imagine this is quite familiar to, to all of you. And this is what happened with this page you're uh, seeing now. It is from Islamic Patterns of uh, Keith Krishlow's. Uh, and I came across this book while I was in Cairo, studying at the library of the American University there. And I was preparing my dissertation on the notion of instant in philosophy and Sufism for the University of Napoli. I took a moment to pause and started browsing books of Islamic art. I opened Islamic patterns and the very first page struck me as fully black with this single dot at the center of it. Then on the second page, this dot irradiated in a line forming a circle. These images that you're watching now instantly clarified me some of the ideas that I had read about time in the previous weeks, which had re remained a bit blurred in, in my mind as I was trying to articulate ideas and time uh, in uh, awfully clear Italian words. But the relation between time and geometry uh, is not as immediate as it can appear when something is suddenly clear. So let us start with uh, these, this, some quotations from the book of the 24 philosophers. First is, God, the sphere, which has as many circumferences as points. And this is, uh, you will see during the presentation, some of, some pictures taken from Islamic patterns without any explanation, but as just illustrations to what I'm saying and that the correspondence between, I hope the correspondence between what I'm saying and images will appear clear to you. Then the second quotation from the book of the 24 philosophers, God, an infinite sphere, whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. And then God, the only one for which whatever belongs to time is always present. The first two quotations are clearly intertwined, as every point in its, uh, 
in this imaginal space is the center of a sphere, which includes innumerable circumferences and spheres. The third can be read as a corollary of the others. If the instant is a dot, and this dot is the center of a sphere, then each sphere contains instants which are present as the one at the center. This phantasmagoric that is a haiku drives mind to protect Haira is just one of the possible descriptions of the reality of time and, more precisely, of the eternal presence of the instant. Before delving deep into Akbarian doctrines of time, I think a quick roundup about the terminology of uh, the Arabic terminology related to time is necessary. The necessity of some terms and to the necessity of defining the ways in which I will use them in, in, during our discussion. A large part of the discussion will be based on well-known works of Ibn Arabi, like the Futuhat al-Makiyyad, Kitab al-Azal, and here we have Maurizio Marconi who translated the, the Kitab al-Azal in, in Italian. I will also introduce some quotations from another work at Pseudo Ibn Arabi's uh, Risalat al-Waqt wa al-An. This is an Akbarian treatise, often attributed to Ibn Arabi, and it deals with this spiritual realization of the Salik, the spiritual wayfarer, seen from the point of view of time. This title does not appear among those identified by Osman Yahya. The only one that may be considered similar is uh, the Repertoire General uh, uh, 213, Kitab al-Hal wal-Maqam wal-Waqt, reported also in the Fehrist. The only manuscript copy is in Baghdad in a majmu'ah of 103 folios. It has been copied in uh, nine, uh, 983, uh, 1575, and it appears to be a quite later text uh, if, if related to Ibn Arabi. This manuscript served for the only edition we have by Qasim Muhammad Abbas in 2004, then republished by Dar al Qutba Ilmiya with other epistles in the, epistles in the collection, Arisal al Wujudiyya. It is not worth, not worth it that the collection of epistles, the manuscript collection in which this uh, Risalat al Waqt Walan is found, includes both, both the Ijaza to Malik, uh, al Malik al Mughaffar and Ibn Arabi's own Fihris, together with other works of dubious attribution, like Manih uh, al Bayyan, the Ahl al Rudwan. So this attests for a phenomenon of misattribution of later, maybe anonymous work circulating among, among Sufis to well-known uh, figures like Ibn Arabi. Despite, despite all these dots regarding the attribution to Ibn Arabi, this very short epistle, it is just two manuscript folios, expresses a doctrine of time and spiritual religiousization that is compatible with the one the Sheikh Al-Akbar presented in his own works. Considering that, despite a couple of mentions by Muhammad al-Hajj Yusuf, this epistle has not been considered up to now by Western scholarship, but if you have notices of works based on this uh, epistle, please tell me. I will present you some excerpts compared to what we find in the Kitab al-Azal and, and the Futuhat. The epistle begins with a significant assertion on time. No, O brother, may God sustain you and give you prosperity through his solicitude, be ye praised and glorified, that the nodal point, madar, of the way of the people of God, that is the most eminent of the Sufis who have reached God most high about the hefts of the instant and what its disposition, hukm, and its decree, marsum, consist of, this is the instant which in technical terms is of the Sufis speak of. It is among the most subtle and obscure aspects of the doctrine, of which only those assisted by light of pure intuition al Basir al Qudsiyya are aware, as well as those capable of reaching the most high presence and the divine reality. The importance of the doctrine of the instant is thus appears to be thus essential and its terminology and metaphysical implications should be clarified as much as possible. 
Thinking as a point of departure, traditional sources of so Quran, Hadith, Akbar, it is not easy to trace a unique local lexicon, lexicon for two reasons. The first is the presence of words of possible Persian origin, Abad, Eternity, Ex parte Post, Azal, Eternity, uh, Aparte Ante, and Zaman, Time, that do not record in the Quran as names. The second, more important, is that the structure of the Arabic temporal lexicon has a surprising fluidity. In the same, the same word like hain can indicate an instant or a period of exactly six months, or another word may at the same time indicate eternity, time as a concept, and again, a period of six months, and this is dahr. To, from a theological point of view, the Asharite atomistic views on time are defined by Massignon with the poetic expression of Milky Way of Instance. In this atomistic view, the correspondence between two events, one known and the other not, would not allow an absolute determination of the position of an event in time. Two independent and concomitant events could not logical, logically fix each other in time as the universe is under the process of a constant renewal in every instant. This is succession of events appears to be dense illusory, delusional. A reflection of this idea can also be seen in Fakhreddin al-Razi's assertion. Not that what gives the existence of time, al-mawjud min al-zaman, is something invisible, which with its flow produces time, which is no other than the instant called an sayal, a flowing instant. The instant, however, remains as the mobile but permanent center of the flow of the time, even if considered only as a phenomenon related to the physical world. Let us think of a poem whose successive projections produce a line, straight, curved, or circular. Tracing this line, that of Zaman, we find three main directions of the movement. The first, more immediate, is that of the same line of time, which moves in the two verses of past and future. The same line has a further dimension in itself, that of the present moment. And finally, there are also supra-temporal and non-temporal dimensions of the various forms of the eternity which are commonly imagined as the ideal beginning and end of the line. This linear view of time, which is the most familiar to most of us, not only contradicts Asharite's uh, theories, but it is also difficult to be linguistically represented in Arabic. In Arabic grammar, there are two ways in which an action can be represented. The perfect past and the model, which can contains the actions already performed and the imperfect, andare, which includes acts not yet completed or to be performed. In this subdivision, the past and the future are only categories constructed on the basis of whether something has been completed or not. This constitutes the true yardstick of temporal judgment, an action begun in the past but not yet finished, is still present, still in progress, imperfect, and therefore uncertain. Time measurement is based, according to Ibn Arabi and also to Aristotelian philosophers, on the comparison with celestial events. So we go back to the Asharai views, but with a different flavor, which are considered uh, certain or known according to a procedure that mirrors that of the Hokama. Ibn Arabi himself in the Kitab al-Azal clearly says that day and night, uh, al-Nahar wal-Layl, are determined by the motion of the sun with respect to the earth, while the day of 24 hours should be calculated according to the motion of the sky of the fixed stars. This approach is also reflected in the ritual dimension of Islam. Considering the five daily prayers, for example, the miqat is the time interval in which the act is considered valid. Each miqat has its own beginning and its end in a very precise instant, waqt. 
from the breaking of the night with the first lights of dawn to the moment uh, when sun rises on the horizons, for instance, for, for such prayer, or from the moment uh, when the sun declines from the zenith uh, for the Zohar prayer. Uh, sorry. Um, does in, in Quran we, we read, do you not see how God wraps together the night in the day and the day in the night and has subdued the sun and the moon so that one runs towards a fixed term, Ajal Musamma, which begins and ends in a precise moment where day and darkness meet. Despite these uh, notes taken from some parts of the Kitab al Azal and the Futuhat, Ibn Arabi dedicates very little space to time as a phenomenon of the physical world. According to him, the rotation of the sky of the zodiac, Falak al Buruj, indicates the day, Yawm, whose fix fixed duration is 24 hours. The possibility for a man to feel this cycle is given by the comparison with the sky of the fixed stars, the second sphere. This is, according to the ancient Arabs and also to uh, our philosopher, philosophers, the measure of a day, yom. We can perceive the movement of the heavens to the comparison with the sky of the fixed stars, al kawaki Tabita. But it is only with the creation of the sun in the fourth of these heavens that the day originates as composed of day and night, which alternate mutually varying their duration. This composition is subsequent to the creation of the day al yom itself, since this originates only in the rotation of the sky of the zodiac, the first created. Thus, the creation of the heavens and the heart and what is between them did not take place in six days of the sun or six nights, but in six days, sitta ayam, as they originated from the rotation of the first heaven. The solar day and, and the night are within the day, so this, the sum of the overall durations of the two always coincides with the 24 hours of the Yawm, without, however, the two being identified except in common parlance. So here we see Bnarabi uh, using the same epistemological framework both of philosophers and of ancient Arabs. But this is valid only when he is speaking of the time as a cosmological matter. Because when we, if not only shifts perspective, he declares in Futuhat, time is a non-existent relationship endowed with imaginary existence. Nisma mutawahim al wujud. For this, we can properly ask when, matter. And time is nothing but the relationship that God has with the word, as are his will, science, and power, that is, attributes that had, had nothing to his essence. If this were not the case, time would be an amr zaid, something that is added to the oneness of God, and the disposition of time would limit him which would be rather impossible in a Bernardist view. So the fact that it is, it, for a Bernardi, time, calculation of time can be done by the comparison of movements, makes this a nispa, a relation. So it is completely, absolutely imaginary and non-existent. There will be much more to say about Ibn Arabi's view on time as a cosmological relation originating from motion. But this passage allows us also to pass from a purely physical and cosmological dimension of time to a more metaphysical one in search for an essential reality that allows us to say that times, time flows and that, to a certain extent, time exists. This passage from a physical to a metaphysical dimension, for Ibn Arabi operates at two levels, which will be the subject of the next sections of this presentation. The first is that of the metaphysical aspect of cosmology, that is, the relationship between time and eternity from the point of view of manifestation and its modes and degrees. 
The second one concerns the aspect of the individual's relationship with the, etern with the eternal, both with respect to his essence as a man and in the context of the spiritual journey, which, as it unfolds, leads the traveler progressively out of the temporal world. For it not be time is an inseparable condition of our perception of the world. This also influences the perception that man has of the eternal and the consequent definitions that arise from it. In Kitab al -Azal, he combines this perspective with that of the realization of the eternal, of eternity in time. This realization can only start from temporal limitation to which we are subject and which is imposed on us when we speak of timeless things, such as the creation or the divine word. Placing them in the past or in the future, even though this position is only metaphorical, limits our ability of understanding them. The limits of our common perception have two orders of consequences for hypnotherapy. The first is that the eternal, Imagine as an extension in Tidad, similar to the temporal one, that is, one thinks of a durative eternity. This leads to the denial of the absolute principality, awaliya of God Most High, that is, to the fact that his essence is the first in a logical and not chronological word order. God is the first by his own essence, beyond what our temporal judgment may be which indeed essentially derives precisely from divine principality. The second order concerns our actual per perception of the eternity as a temporal datum. By comparing with, uh, uh, it with the special, uh, uh, special condition, Ibn Arabi affirms that for us, every object, however distant, is in a position related to our own one. On the other hand, from the point of view of God, and of the knowledge that God has of us, we are not in any location. Thus, our being conditioned leads us to think that the divine, divine word, such as the controversial words, uh, take off your sandals, recurring in the Quran, that God said to Moses on Mount Sinai, were pronounced in pre-eternity as they were not yet. That is, that in a certain sense, they had existed before in eternity. On the contrary, says it not only, it was etern uh, these words were eternally existing in divine silence. And when the time came in the word for it to be pronounced, for them to be pronounced, uh, they came into existence, manifesting themselves in the word. This is a key step in understanding how eternity is related to the word and more specifically to individuals. When not denying the possibility of the ascension of the saint or, or the prophet, in this case, Ibn Arabi is highlighting the descent of the principle that manifests itself in God's word, which although eternally existing with God, manifests itself in what for the word is a given moment. Nonetheless, this divine word remains in itself outside the boundaries of time. This point of view can also be extended to the very question of creation. The al-haq, the truth, says Ibn Arabi in Kitab al-Azal, has determined qaddara, things eternally, azalan, and has not existentiated wujida, the word, in pre-eternity for two reasons. First, because such an eventuality would deny divine oneness, since there would be another existence besides God. Therefore, with eternity being a negative attribute, that is, a form of negation of anything before what is eternal, if creation had such a priority, there would be two eternals of negation of anything before and after what is eternal, with more precise. There would be two etern uh, eternals, and God would not be the creator. Instead, what is possible is the eternal determination taqdeer, of the word in divine science, which is very different from his existence. As it now says that the, 
I am at Habitat did not smell the fragrance of existence. So that ex bringing the word to existence is not eternal. Al-fi'l la yakun azalan. So God was not in a certain state. And afterwards, he brought the word into existence. The moment in which the word was existentiated cannot be considered through the categories of time. It is therefore wrong to think that the instant of existentiation in time is in time. It is also wrong to think that it is not in time, as it is, in fact, eternal. In Fusus al-Hikam, the creation as coming to existence is considered to uh, happen after the divine decree al-Qadha in the first Uzair. This consists in the disposition that God gives to things. This disposition is regulated according to the science aim that God has of them, which is eternal as one of the attributes of the divinity. Things, even before they existed, exist in a different form in divine science, having in themselves all the characteristics that will be part of their manifestation. The destiny, Qadr, of everything is the arrangement of in time of what things are in themselves, according to what is established by divine decree. Creation, as the determination of essences, is eternal and internal to the dialectic between divine science and his decree. On the contrary, the temporal development of the, of the decree concerns the entities as manifested and existing. The measurement of time is this, therefore a completely worldly affair, which, is which in no way concerns creation as an act of bringing the object of divine science to manifestation. These are eternally within, not subject to change. The creative act as the gift of existence stands completely outside of any temporal evaluation, not linked to the categories of before or after, or to eternity as duration. On the contrary, the succession of events is constituted by the unraveling one after another of the aspects that eternally the divine decree is placed in the essences of every being. The coming into existence of these aspects in time manifests them, them not, not in an eternal way, not in a temporal way. So there is an ambiguity that Ibn Arabi resorts commenting upon the verse you are seeing now. And there are in doubt about the new creation. The context in which this verse is found in the Quran and according to major Sunni commentaries, um, allow us to interpret this as uh, the second creation after the resurrection on the day of judgment. So the resurrection of the bodies. But Ibn Arabi reads here in addition and not denying the immediate meaning, a different one which refers to the impermanence and constant renewal, renewal of the cosmos. Here, reprising also the Asharai notion we have seen before. The process of emanation that comes from the divine essence called Nafas rahman is incessant. Consequently, the process of creation, that is of manifestation and bringing to existence, is also pre uh, incessant, perpetual. According to Ibn Arabi, the way in which creation is perpetuated had already been seen by Asharai theologian, summarized by the saying that I reported here, la tabqa zamanain, that is, there is no accident that remains in time for more than an instant. But for the Sheikh al -Akbar, this is only one aspect of the reality of the matter. If it is true that accidents are impermanent, even the substance, that should act as a substrate is, uh, is composed of accidents and is therefore also impermanent. In reality, everything is accidental with respect to the one true existence, which belongs only to God. So the fact that the Asharite theologians do not detect this aporia 
in their theory of accidents makes their understanding of the reality of creation partial. Every moment, not just accident, is new. From the temporal point of view, therefore, it cannot be said in an exclusive way that creation took place or rather does happen in time or in eternity. The non-being of the world does not occur in a moment of time, in a specific moment in time, but it is the speculative mental faculty, one, that imagines that between the being of God and the existentiation of the lower world, uh, there is a duration. This is due to the conditioning of the senses, accustomed to always conceiving temporal anteriority and posteriority among things created in time. This is from Inshad the way. For Ibn Arabi, there is an inverse correspondence between the day of the essence, the Yawm al the broadest and highest of the divine days, and the instant of spiritual realization. This inverse, correspond this inverse correspondence can be surprising since one would be led to think that this day is the longest in terms of duration due to the already noted inability on our part to conceive eternity outside our temporal, ling temporal linguistic and ontological boundaries. In fact, says Ibn Arabi, this is the shortest of the divine days. The instant should not be considered as a portion of time, but as taking up a uh, well-known saying of the Sufis, a sword that cuts time, marking the present state as a man al-hal as disconnected from both past and future. This present should not be considered to core as mani the manifestation of eternity in a simplistic and disjoint conception of the relationship between the human and the divine, uh, divine planes of reality. Ibn Arabi even states that this present is not existent in itself. Greater, this is a non-existent -exist without existence, states in the Futuha, to the same extent that the whole creation is non-existent with respect to its principle. The instant, instant is the space of existence given to the universe by perpetual creation, by the daily work of God. And there is something in Risalat Ayyam uh, al of Ibn Arabi about this. And is therefore also conceivable as an instant in a more ontological rather than temporal sense. Existing, so the instant is existing between two non existence that is past and future. In this space comparable to a geometric point, the void of any dimension, the entire universe ceases to exist and begins its existence again. In this same space, the link between eternity and time is realized both for the individual and for the cosmos. On the one hand, there is the eruption of the divinity into the manifested world. On the other, there is the progress of the traveler on spiritual path to God. We read uh, still from the Fas uh, Ozair in the Fusus al Hikam that the instant is unique and present, mushahid, witnessing but difference differs according to the stations. The instant of the true spiritual wayfarer is an isthmus between divine majesty and beauty. Such is its inner aspect, botan, which refers by Fa'ina at the same time to the attribute of beauty and to that of majesty. That is, the instant walk of the disciple is a present now and that comes from the oneness of the one, which goes, goes beyond or is far more important, a jalla, what is, uh, what is commonly indicated by the word instant, being essentially other than it and being precedent, incident, sadiq with respect to the plan of divinity. Extension, uh, extension and return to the condition of the new creation, fishat, 
al-khalq al-jadid. To this alludes what God said, but they doubt a new creation. The divine presence can manifest itself to an individual in particular moments and ways, and it is, as it is the case of prophets and saints. In reality, the entry of the eternity into the cosmos in, is constant and concerns every entity according to its capacity to welcome the existence that is given and taken away at every moment. Every moment of, of, moment of time, according to this perspective, has its root in divinity and its branches in creation. The particular moments in which an individual is aware of the figure of this inverse arbor and sees each branch linked to its root and the presence of this in each body constitute the vertexes of the spiritual realization. Ibn Arabi underlines how this instant is both union, jam, and dispersion, fuck. Only the distinct perception of, uh, of one of these two aspects and not of the other, gives rise to the different definitions of the instant. The instant, even though it, sh even though it shows multiple aspects, still remains unique in its nature of present state hal, which is a limit between what is past and what is future, like a point placed on a circumference, says it not a bit in, uh, in Shadawai. From this point also, Azal and Abad depart the eternal apartheante and that ex parte post, which, like the past and the future in time, have no existence compared to perpetuity, the one which is the time of the present state. So we see that it is the, the, it is the instant which is perpetual and not the, uh, and not Azal or Abad, which are considered in common parlance, parlance eternity. The present time constitutes the starting point of the path, and at the same time, the point of arrival, as if once again taking up the image of the circumference, a point is isolate, isolated on it. In the Rissalatan walked what an, read a, a similar statement, but with different implications. The spiritual wayfarer is in this in this instant becomes aware of the divine attributes of beauty and benevolence and of those of majesty and dominance Qahir, at the same time and it is god who, who in that unique time brought it into being precisely because in that instant he decreed that the traveler perform, performs the adoration for which he existed he is a witness of the benevolence of the truth towards him and the consideration in which he holds it, making it beautiful, Hasuna, to go towards the in that uh, in that very moment. As for being conscious of the attribute of majesty in that same subtle instant, it is nothing other than the awareness of the negation sub of existence as his own, which in that same instant returns to God through perfect worship. This passage of the Risalat al Wat uses a terminology that echoes the Akbarian notions of Jalal and Jamal and shifts from a strictly time-based paradigm to an ontological one, based on the nature of the divine names belonging to one of the two categories. This shift is possible only if the Salik abandons the illusion of his individual existence, this can be synthesized in Ibn Arabi's interpretation of the divine saying, uh, If you don't see him, surely he sees you. But Ibn Arabi's interpretation of this saying, we all know, uh, is based on applying a pose, you could say the comma, uh, after the taku. So the meaning shifts to, if you are not, you see him for surely he sees you. The author of the, the, the Rizal al Wat share the very same, shares the very same interpretation of this passage. And for him, this tradition implies a form of essential adoration that the true muhaqqat realizes in the very instant of, an, of the unveiling. 
This adoration is the one alluded to in another prophetic tradition, saying that every prayer should be performed as it was the last one, a farewell prayer, Salatul Muwaddiyah. Here the art, the servant, stands in the instant of realization, renouncing to any form of attribution of existence to himself. Ibn Arabi comments upon this in Lam Takun Tarahu tradition in diverse places of the Futuhat al -Makiya. In chapter 69 on the secrets of prayer, when discussing the times of the day where prayer is prohibited, Ibn Arabi said, the servant is absent in the moment of witnessing shuhud, because the witness is taking possession of the witness. Therefore, there is no invocation in this moment. We can easily see how the two interpretations, while similar, diverge a little bit. Because the, for the author of the Risala, the Salik in the moment he pictures the, the, the Salik, the spiritual with her, in the moment before renouncing to his own individual existence, actualized in performing ritual prayer. On the other hand, in this passage of the Futuhat Ibn Arabi refers to the correspondence between worldly times where prayer is prohibited, so there is no possibility of invocation to God, and the moment of witnessing of the true reality, where the subject is deprived of any form of individuality. So he cannot stand in any form and is not able to perform any act of devotion. Despite these differences, it is not, wor not worthy that. So from a slightly divergent perspectives, for both uh, authors, the author of the Risawat al waqt wal -an and Ibn Arabi, the time of prayer is the one in which the real encounter between divinity and human is possible. In one case, it is a non-temporal instant. In the other, it is a worldly instant in which time is symbolically interpreted and, and seen as out of the possibility of measuring it through the miqats of, pray, uh, of canonical prayer. And I think I took a lot of time and I would move to the conclusion, quoting a phrase of uh, Kit Critchlow from the introduction of, to Islamic patterns that I, I think it sums up the whole discussion. For instance, we take a point which having emerged proceeds to describe a line. The line moves laterally or in a curve to describe a plane. The plane rotates or moves in a further direction to describe or create the solid dimension. If we take these moves into the three dimensions as the symbolic of the creation of space or our world, then it follows that we can reverse them in the folding up of the dimensions, leading us to the point of unity. So what Ibn Arabi invites us while, uh, when commenting uh, the, uh, the, the times of the day where prayer is not possible is exactly what Kit Richlos is telling us. They see the reverse of the unfolding of space, but from the point of view of time. And thank you.